Oh, hold on. I put them in the wrong order. Do the icebreaker first. There we go. Do a quick icebreaker and wait for anybody else to join and then we'll get going. So, all right. So our icebreaker, have you seen these R memes? It's a number of R memes that have come up. I thought I'd put them on here. The first one, pivot longer. This is <laughs> one that, that Colin introduced us to a couple weeks ago. Um, I hadn't seen it before. It was, it was pretty good. The other one is pivot wider. So same thing, just the other direction, right? Um, here's this one. I was surprised when my daughter said she learned R at school yesterday. And then I remembered that she's four and she meant the letter. My priors are all skewed. So. <laughs> um, the next one, speaking of, this one had me laughing though when I saw this one. All you need to do is just pivot it longer, solve the problem. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, let's see, what's the next one? This one I thought was good too. Suez Canal filter ships that are not evergreen. And there you go, we solve it. No problem. Um, I laughed at, at this one too. Dad, why is my sister's name Rose? Because your mother loves roses. Thanks, Dad. No problem, Library Tidyverse. I thought that was pretty funny, too. And then this one reminded me of another of, of another comic strip. It's not really an R-related one, but if, have you guys ever seen KXCD, or I think that's what it is? This guy writes, like, computer-related ones. So the mom gets a phone call from the school. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh, dear, did he break something? Well, in a way... Did you really name your son Robert? <laughs> Robert Drop Table Student. Oh yes, the little Bobby Tables we call him. <laughs> uh, well, we've lost this year's students' records. I hope you're happy, and I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So, if you don't get this one, I guess there's ways that on a like on a, on a web interface, it might put in like a a field for name, and if if you put in the right code, you can actually, it'll, it'll interpret that and drop tables in the background. So anyway, I was laughing at this one too. Yes, little Bobby Tables, we call him. All right, so that's good. Just some R memes. The, the funniest part about going through these R memes and trying to find them is like, I actually got the joke on probably like 4% of them. And I had to scroll down to the next one because I didn't, I didn't get the joke. I don't know what that is. And then these are, these are the only ones that I really got. So, all right, hopefully that was fun. All right, so here's our, our agenda. Quick housekeeping reminders. <clears throat> then, um, then Maria is gonna take a couple of minutes and talk about our exercises.com. And then we're gonna jump into chapter 15 factors and then next week in getting help. All right, so off we go. These are the typical um, housekeeping reminders that we put on the only change here is this part where it says, take time to learn the theory. Um, I've added in this new one here. This is a, a white paper research paper called Wrangling Categorical Data in R that talks a lot about, about the stuff that we're talking about today, categorical data, factors, levels, those different kinds of things. So I'm sure if you just Google Wrangling Categorical Data in R, um, you can come across it or else also there's a link to it from the book that we're going through in chapter 15. All right. So I always like to point these out because it's one thing to go through and just learn how to type out the code like, like the book teaches us, but there's a lot of value in learning the theory behind it and how all the different data structures work together and so on. All right. Do the chapter exercises and plan on teaching one of the lessons. Okay, cool. All right. So our exercises, Maria, can I turn it over to you then? Yeah, sure. All uh, right. So I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is the workflow that I use to find exercises. This is not limited to our exercises.com, but it's a general approach that I use and to have a better guidance um, on the topics of this book in general. So. Uh, so what I do is for every topic, once I cover, I first cover the, the, the contents in the book in R for Data Science. So let's say that is data visualization. I cover the, 
the the contents and I do all of the exercises. That's what I do first. And then the immediate next step is to see if the topic is covered in, in one of these RStudio primers. So I don't know if you have seen these. These two are new. So these, these are some very cool ones to check out. Um, but for example, these write functions uh, iterate um, tidy data, this is ggplot, work with data. These are very related to the contents of, of R for data science. So if I see that a primary is available for the topic, I go and I do it. And always I find something useful that complements very nicely the contents of the, of the book. And I always find exercises because the, these are tutorials where you have to write code and do exercises sequentially. So it's a very interactive uh, learning experience. So I, I can put this on the chat later. Um, so when I, once I check out our primers, the next thing that I do is look for exercises of or tutorials. Uh, because sometimes tutorials are very, very good and sometimes they come with exercises. And that's, I, I feel like for me, it's one of the best ways to learn, to actually practice uh, the skills and not just learn them um, theoretically. So what I do is I literally just Google our exercises and here one recommendation, key recommendation is instead of saying visualization in R or some abstract uh, term, I use the name of the package because otherwise you are going to get exercises that you might have to solve them using base R or using a different package. Um, but here I want to focus on the packages that are covered in R for data science. So, and this has happened to me in the past, especially with data import, that I just put R exercises data import and the exercises actually required me to use something very different. So it is very important to use the name of the package. And once I get the name of the package, I, I start looking at that. Usually R Studio Pops, um, usually contains the same information as our exercises.com. So if I see one of those, uh, I immediately click on those. Um, and that's what I get. So I, I try to go through different types of exercises. Our exercises.com are by far my favorite, but, but sometimes you can see other types of exercises that people have contributed. And these are very good. So this is, for example, uh, another of our pops. And, and these are very good. And usually they come with a solution. So, so it's very nice to work first, try yourself, and then see the, the solution. So to show you the workflow, for example, this is, um, this is a set of exercises for a string R. Again, here I search for a string R exercises and not just strings or, or something. And once I get the exercises, what I do is just um, start by copying like all the content. So exercise, all of the exercises, I just copy them. Um, and once I have them, I paste them into an R, uh, R script. I guess it would be better to use R Markdown, but for me it's easier to just paste them in an R script. And then I don't know. So let's say if I were to do this, I just copy them. And I don't know if you know this trick, but if you, if you, um, if you select everything and then um, use the shortcut command in Mac or control in PC, control shift C, is gonna comment everything. Have you seen that? So then, so it, again, it's command shift C or for PC, uh, control shift C at the same time, the letter C as in cookie. And so then you would have everything commented. And so you can start working your way through each of the exercises. So this is an example of something like already solved. So I go through the exercises and I solve them. Um, and then for some, some of them, if they are unclear, I put a note there, or oh, take a, sometimes I put a note, or oh, take a look at these 
look at the at the solution because I have the feeling that they did something, they might have done something different, or I'm not entirely sure that this is the right or most efficient way to do it. And that is the workflow of how I search for exercises and extra resources and how I use them, how I actually go about solving, solving them and, and using what is published on the web. And yeah. So that's really great. I knew about um, our studio cloud, um, but I hadn't ever really gone through any of the primers. So I'm gonna check that one out, especially the one on iterate. I saw that one there. That's the one I'm working on right now is, is the iterate one. So that's good. Thank you. Any, go ahead. No, it was great. No sense. Yeah, that's good. Good stuff. All right. Good. All right. So then from, from here, we are going to go into, um, into the, the topics from, from chapter 15 on factors. Okay. So a couple of extracts then from the book itself. And just to start our discussion in the book, it says in our factors are used to work with categorical variables, variables that have a fixed and known set of possible values. Okay. And so usually I think uh, most factors tend to be strings and there's a difference between just a num just a list of strings and ones that are factors, meaning that they have fixed and known set of possible values. And one example is this right here, this example of months. And we've got it listed right now as December or DC, but the abbreviations DEC, APR, JAN, and MAR. And as long as these are just strings and it's just a, a list of, of string characters, then R doesn't take any particular action, doesn't try to control for typographical errors or invalid entries or anything like that. Um, as you can see here, JAM is just as valid as JAN or XYZ or whatever it might be. Um, and this is, this is before it actually converts these into factors. Similarly, sorting is always alphabetical instead of in a, a common or a well-known order. Okay? So if you were to sort these while, they're still, while they are still strings, it's going to come out in this order, APR, DEC, JN, and MAR. Okay? Uh, but, but the point of factors is to be able to convert a list like this that R sees as just a bunch of strings to convert it into something more meaningful in, in our case, like abbreviations for months. Yeah. All right. Um, and so to do that, um, the, the really the way to approach it is just like before looking at what the data presents, you create the factors levels. Okay. So this is the first step is thinking about the, this column or, or this set of data is going to represent the months of a year, or this is going to represent genders, or and it's going to represent states in the United States or Canadian provinces or whatever it is. Um, so you know ahead of time what that column is supposed to represent. And you set that forth to R using this idea of levels. Okay, so you take this idea, I know that there are 12 months and I know what valid abbreviations I need and I know what order they go in. And so then you create an object that holds the levels. So in this case, you can see they put in month underscore levels is all these abbreviations. These are the valid ones and they're in this order. Okay. So now that exists before we really do anything with the data. Okay. But now you can apply the factor to your data. So if you have another vector of sample months, DEC, APR, JAN, MAR, JAN, and, um, and then you can, you can factor this vector of sample months by adding in this argument here of levels equals month level, month underscore levels. So you use this command of factor, factor what, this, this vector of raw data using, using the levels that we set out in the, in the previous step. Okay? 
then the output will include the levels of the factor. On the other hand, if you have this vector, which is, I've called here typo months, DEC, APR, JAM, this one's misspelled, and MAR, then when you do factored typo month, then it's going to, the errors are going to be converted into an NA value. Okay. So let me run through this. Can everybody see the R screen? Is that right? Okay. Good. All right, so this is under demo one. So first we load the tidyverse, runs through, okay. So we have here the sample months, and this is just a random string of, of month data. So we create that object. And I'm gonna, at the same time, I'm gonna create typo months. This is the one that has a, a misspelled value there. And this level here, row 10, is what creates the, the levels of the factor. All the valid, values that that i'm willing to accept in the order that that they should be okay so now i create that object too when i factor these and i create this new object called factor sample months then it's going to first factor sample months from row eight and it's going to use those the levels that i set out in row 10 okay and you can see down oh, that i need to run factored sample months and you can see it gives December, April, January, March, January, just like I expected. And it lists out all of the valid levels there. Okay. Now I'm also going to create another object of factored typo months from here, doing the same thing, just with the one that has the, the typographical error in it. And then when I run that one, you can see that it replaced it, it replaced JAM, which was an invalid uh, value with NA, but it still gives me the full list of all the acceptable levels right there. Okay. So it's a way of controlling to make sure that the values that you're getting in the data are ones that, that you want and that you can use. Cool, any questions? All right. So then going back here to the next one, a lot of the next examples, in fact, most of what comes in in this chapter comes from the general social survey, which you can look at by GSS underscore cat. It's loaded in with the tidyverse. If we just take a look at the at the columns of this data, there's something like what eight columns: year, age. Uh, year is the year of the survey. Age is the survey survey participants' age. Marital is their marital status. Race, our income is the reported income. Party ID has to do with their political party affiliation. Relig is their religious denomination. And then TV hours is the number of hours per day that they watch TV. Okay. So you can see a, a, an extract of this um, down here. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, if you run the STR to look at the structure of this data set, you'll see that a number of the variables are, have already been converted into factors. And that's really the point of the data set is that this has factors already incorporated in it. Most likely when it first, when it was, was first generated, these columns were just a list of strings, um, nothing special, but now they've been converted into factors. So we have factors under marital, race, uh, our income, party ID, religion, and denom. Okay. So since since a number of them have already been stored as factors, we can inspect the levels, and you can do that just by uh, by naming the data source and then subsetting for the uh, for the column or identifying the column here. I picked race. You could pick whichever one you want, and then you use the levels command. <clears throat> And then you'll see that if you if you do this one, it comes out as other, black, white, and not applicable. Okay. Now, um, that is to say then that these are the only values that you will find in in the column race of this data set. Okay. Now, um, the other really important thing to know about factors is that even though we interact with them using the names right here, other, black, white, and not applicable, they get stored in R 
as integers. Every, all of them, all factors get stored as integers. Um, and they start with one and they just increase up. So in this particular case, other gets stored as one, black gets stored as two, white gets stored as three, and not applicable to get stored as four. In the, in the months, when we did the months, it was January was one, February was two, March was three, and so on. Okay. So it's important to know, uh, maybe we don't interact with it a whole lot, but, but this, uh, this integer numbering that, that happens in the background helps with things like ordering the factors in a way that's meaningful. And so that way, if you can, you can order something like um, low, medium, high, or, you know, uh, bad, sort of bad, neutral, sort of good, and really good. Uh, you can order those even though they don't line up alphabetically that way. All right. So speaking of reordering, um, what we're going to do is we'll you go back to R and we'll reorder the factors from uh, from this general social survey here. So let me move down here to demo two. So I'm extracting out the uh, this column. Uh, relig and creating this summary. Okay, so let me create that summary. I'm grouping by those those factors, and then summarizing, um, and then uh, also uh, calculating the TV hours and account for those. So if we look at um, the summary data, you can see here each of the factors is listed in the first column. Uh, median age is here, number of TV hours is here, or the average TV hours is here, and then the total count is here on the end. Now, what's important to notice here is the order that these factors show up in here. No answer is first, don't know, interdenominational, Native American, Christian, so on, so on, okay? And that's important because um, as you look at the levels, it's going to come out to be the exact same order. No answer, don't know, interdenominational, and, and as it goes. And so the order is important there. If we go to plot these in ggplot, um, this is one analysis that you can do on it. You'll notice that it still lines up the factors in the, in the same order. So number one is at the bottom, two, three, on up. So it keeps that same order. But as we can see, this is not particularly easy to work with data um, because these, these points are scattered all over the place and there's not uh, the kind of order to it that you'd like. So what we would really like to do is put these factors here in order based off of how they fall in, in terms of the TV hours, okay? So you can do that with this, with this command called factor reorder. And um, you can see this is still a ggplot call we're still, we're still plotting the, the same data set here of religious summary. Uh, we're plotting TV hours on the x-axis, but we're reordering the y-axis. The y-axis is going to be the, the factors in relig, but they're ordered in terms of the TV hours. Okay, makes sense? So once we run that, then it's going to reorder all of these factors from lowest to highest in terms of TV hours. And now it makes more sense to, as you look at this visualization, because up at the top we know it has the highest number of TV hours and then it decreases down from there. Okay. So this is a, just a lot easier to interpret. Hey Ryan, I got a quick question about this. I just had a thought. Yes. Um, so you know how you have that FC, I don't know, I, I this is just a thought that I had. So like FCT underscore reorder. Uh -huh. So we're, we're passing a, a, a column into that as in like religion order by the column TV hours. Mm -hmm. Can we specify our own separate levels into FCT reorder and it will order it like we want it to? So if we created our own separate object outside of it yeah. and then put that object in there, will that will that work? Yes, yes, it will. Um, and so the way to do that um, would be reorder relig. Um, actually, I, I don't think you would use reorder. I, I think 
there's another example in a second, and I think that that's how you would you would do it um, to order them in the way that you want. Uh, maybe we can try it here in a second once we once we get to that one. Yeah, it was just a thought because I was thinking like if you had a separate object with the levels that you wanted, so say there's certain things you want to highlight in your plot, I wonder if you could create a separate object outside of it. But yeah, maybe we can experiment with it because that, that just was a thought that came to my mind. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, the the other thing that's that's really common with factors besides reordering them is also uh, modifying them, um, it, just changing changing what they are. Um, so let's go back to R and look at this this next demo here. <clears throat> so under so there's also a column card called party ID. Okay, so if we look at this where we extract the party ID. You can see down here, this is the count by party ID. So no answer has 154 respondents. Don't know one other party, 393 respondents, strong Republican and so on. Okay. So what, uh, what we notice here is that, well, so what we notice is that, that these particular factors as it is in the raw data are maybe not as descriptive as we would like or, or don't look as good. IND comma near rep, uh, we, maybe we'd like to improve on that. Not STR Democrat, maybe we'd like to improve on that. So you can use a, a function here called factor recode and designate exactly how you want each of those factors to really turn out. And it uses the same context that we normally talk about in the past, which is new name equals old name. So if we're gonna recode the party ID, then we do it like this. So if it's if it's strong Republican, we want that to come back as REP, not, not STR Republican, come back as REP, um, IND, come back as IND and so on. Okay. So we've mutated this so that there's a new column for that. And if I run this, you can see that it consolidates down. It get it it, it grouped it grouped some of those factors into the categories that that I actually wanted. Okay. So there's ways to to clear those out. Okay. Pretty easy. Let's see. Now this was this is an interesting one too. So um, I I. I myself had a question about modifying these permanently. Okay, so one thing that we can remember, and this goes back from one of the early um, sessions that Colin went over, was that anything that we do in the tidyverse is temporary. It just it, it just modifies what we're looking at in front of us. It, the underlying data doesn't change. And so what I had was thinking about was if I could go back to this with a race column. You can see that it comes back as other, black, white, and not applicable in that order, one, two, three, and four. Now, if I wanted to change those to a different order, like the one I've got here, not applicable, black, other, white, then I can do that using the factor relevel command and then just specifying what order I would like those levels to be. But watch this, so we just did this one, and the levels came back other, black, white, not applicable. Then I impose this command right here of, of factory level, and it goes through and changes. And right here, you can see levels, not applicable, black, other, white. Okay, great. So it changed the levels just like I had specified here. But then when we go back and look at them again, it goes back to the original order, other, black, white, and not applicable. Okay, and that's because this, this line here, specifically this portion, really just overlaid um, those changes on top of, of the raw data. It didn't actually change the raw data itself. Okay. So in order to make that change, um, you can use this command where you start out with the data frame, GSS cat, and then mutate the race column to make it into the uh, into the the levels that I was hoping for that I was looking for here, so by actually making this assignment, then it does change it permanently. Um, I hope anyway. 
I didn't actually try it, but yes. So not applicable black, other white, okay? So, so it's an important thing that, that you get reminded and when I say you get reminded, I got reminded of it, that, that these changes don't necessarily uh, change the underlying data until you actually make an assignment to change it. All right. Um, so that can make those things permanent. And then the last one to look at, I think I had this here, demo number five here. Um, so the other thing that I want to, going back over here to party ID, if we look at how these are um, and we look at the count, um, so, Right, so this one, I, for this one, I wanted to highlight um, these other two commands in, in frequency order and in order. So as we go here and we look at this one, um, you can see, but based off of the numbers here, the largest number of respondents to this survey were independents with 4,119 respondents. And the second highest was not strong Democrat 3,690, okay? So by doing this command here of factor in frequency, then it's gonna reorder the factors based off of this number, by this, num this number of counts, okay? So if I do this, then you're gonna see that the number, that the levels are gonna assume a different order. They're gonna assume number one will be independent, number two will be not strong Democrat. And so if we do that, then you can see how they line up here, independent, not strong Democrat. And it'll follow down with the number of respondents, okay? all the way down to don't know, which only has one. Okay. And then in order, now I've got to remember what in order does. In order, by the order in which they first appear, okay, in the data. Right. So when you run it by in order, if we were to look at the raw data, we would see that IND comma near rep would be record number one has that. And then like record number two, potentially, or the next new one that shows up is not strong Republican. The next new one that shows up would be independent. Now there could be the first three could all be this, but then number four would be this maybe four, five, six, seven, and eight are this one, and then nine is this one. But so, so every time there's a new factor that shows up in the raw data, it becomes a level. Okay. The other one that I thought was interesting was this one, which is factor other, where you can specify out of all of the, out of all of the factors, all the levels that are given, I only want to keep independent and other party and everything else I want to make into other. Okay, so for that you use factor other and by doing that you can hit this and you can see it retains other party, independent and everything else is just other. If I wanted to keep, for instance, um, let's say no answer as well, now I have no answer, other party, independent, and other. And then there's also, um, is it drop, I think? I think this works the other way, the, just the inverse. So it keeps everything and it puts these three into this other grouping, if that makes sense. Okay. So, so a lot of the value of, of, um, of, of factors <clears throat> is this ability to, um, to keep control of the factors there. And um, I think I somehow lost, somehow I lost uh, what I was gonna say about the name of this package. So this package is called Four Cats. I thought that was gonna show up on the, uh, on the slide, but it didn't. So, uh, so the name of the package is four cats. Let me go over to this because we'll get to that in just a second. And Colin, I'll get back to your, your question. We'll experiment with that in a second here. So, 
So here is the package. It's part of the Tidyverse, so it gets loaded automatically with the Tidyverse. It's called Four Cats. They always point out that it's an anagram of factors. And the sticker here is four cats in a box. Um, and the, the value of it here is for, it provides tools for working with factors, which are R's data structures for categorical data. Okay. So this cheat sheet I found to be very helpful too. <clears throat> um, let me pull it up here in a little bit more, a little bit more room here as well. So it goes through a couple of other um, interesting ways in, of, of handling this categorical data. Uh, we just looked at the ones that I, that I thought was interesting here. So re-leveling in, in frequency, in order. You can reverse the factors. You can shift them a number up or down. You can shuffle the factors so that they're somewhat randomized. Um, you can reorder them. And, and change them all different kinds of things. So, uh, so this is helpful and it's easy to, it's not too, too bad to practice with these. All right, any questions? Anybody had any experiences working with, with factors? Yeah, I, I haven't yet either, but I can see the value of it. Um, I know that in the work that we do, uh, I'll always, it, it, it happens almost every time whenever I do some analysis, I've got some weird string character in there or string that I didn't expect. And uh, I just keep thinking that if we had better control over our, our categorical variables, then we wouldn't have these, uh, st these stray values come in that, that we aren't anticipating. So. I, I think the only time I use it was when I wanted to be sure that my uh, bar plot was in the order I wanted. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, sur survey data is, I mean, survey data is just littered with factors. And so um, I probably use, well, I was just using them today for a survey that we've done. And so um, pretty much any demographic variable will probably be in a categorical. Um, I've used, I, I've used more like FCT lump more, um, for some of these operations, but looking at some of the, um, factor, uh, in order and then the factor other, like those, I didn't really kind of use, I haven't used in, in any of the work that I've done. A lump. I remember seeing that one here, but I hadn't, hadn't used it. Um, so how does this one work? From the way I understand is it, it collapse groups. It's kind of like the other, you're able to collapse it into like an other group, but it's like based on like, you can base it on like proportion or the number. So if like you had a lot of factors, you could say like, I only want the top five, take everything else and put it into an other category. It's, it's kind of a faster way than doing like the, what was it? The FCT other or something. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And you can um, make it so you can specify the number of groups that you want to have other than other, uh, mm -hmm. but you can also make it so that the other group is the maxim has the maximum frequency value n value, such that it is still the smallest group. Oh, really? Okay. If you just don't if you just don't specify the n number of groups that you want to have other than other, if you just leave it like that. Uh, it will make it such that the other is has the maximum value that is still the smallest, the smaller okay. than the other one. Yeah, That's smaller good. than the other one. Is that this part FCT lump min, or is that separate? Do you say that's the default? That's the default behavior. Yeah, that's the default behavior. If you don't specify, you see at the very end that it says the factor and then n equals one. Uh huh. So if you don't put the n equals one, then the default is going to be um, the maximum value that is still smaller than the other groups. Yeah. Nice. I'll have to work with that one. <clears throat> All right. All right, good. Um, all right, so if we, 
Let's go back then, um, Colin, maybe we can dive into your question again here. So that was, was related to, to, uh, to this one, right? To where we wanted to actually specify an order that we want. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's a factory order. So like, instead of like basing the ordering based on like a column in the data set, can yeah. we create a separate vector and then order it by that vector. You see what I'm saying? Yep, yep. So I think, let me pull up what all the values are again here. Oops. I'm just curious to see. And then the other thing that I was curious about is like, well, what if you only provide one factor level? Uh, will it like just rearrange by that? Or I don't know, I'm just kind of curious about how that works. So um, let me see if this works. So if we do factor right here, grid, and then do uh, levels equals C. Um, let me just pick a couple here that fill up. Um, um, I think Protestant was another one too. Yeah. Are, oh no, you're looking at, yeah, so you're looking at religion. Yeah. So, um, so if this works right, then I think anything that's not these might turn into NAs. Let's just see what happens. All right. Okay, do you see it over there? Yep. It actually works. That is unreal. So we so we use the just the regular factoring factor that that we did back at the very beginning for um, for uh, where is it for this one mm -hmm. same same format here we just did factor and then uh, specified the factors that we wanted of course we could have done this as a, as a separate um, object as well too um, so. So I guess that way works, but it makes me think that there's probably another way that would work maybe a little faster. Some of the ones that you guys were talking about. Um, I don't know. Anybody else have any other ideas how to do it if you wanted to specify your own, your own factors? Uh, I do that usually in uh, Airbase with order. Just with other? Yes. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I just use it with order in base areas. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you posted in the chat. I saw that. I I don't think I've ever used ordered, but it makes it makes intuitive sense what it's doing. I was just wondering if like the FCT relevel, you know, does the same thing that you were mentioning in the chat there, and so um, I would suspect it does the same thing. I was just curious when I was looking at it. I was like, huh. It's just that what it could be useful is sometimes you need to do that. You need to order the factor because it if you do some tree analysis, if you want to be sure that the tree are always in the same um, um, in the same order, if you don't want to mix up stuff. So, uh, but yeah, it's the only time that sometimes I have to order factor just because the code I'm using want to have everything in this order for um, plotting the tree. So there, is some, there is some benefit, and after you can see the nice uh, uh, smalls, and uh, there is some benefit sometimes to order the factor for some analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also thinking about with like the re-level, uh, if, you're, if you're plot or if you have like a specific project focusing on a specific group, like say high in, well, no, that's not a really good one because you could just order top to bottom, but like I don't know, education, say you were interested in people who have a college education and you wanted to highlight them in your plot over other groups using FCT relevel to say, okay, I'm going to put college, you know, people with college education at the top and then let it fall from there. So that's what I was thinking of using relevel for is if like you have a specific purpose for that plot. So maybe, so maybe we can do that with, with this one. So it would be FCT level, right? Am I thinking about this correctly? So then, and we wanted to, to focus just on one 
And I don't know the syntax exactly. Um, just, yeah, just C, right? Yeah, I think it's just C. Maybe not re-level, but reorder. Like you still want to show all the all the categories, uh -huh. but you just want to shift one to the top so that you can say like this one. And maybe that's where FCT shift comes into play. You just use FT, FT or FCT shift. Yeah. Because then it will just move that one. But I'm just thinking about using like FCT re-level just to move one to the top. So what, yeah, so what order would the rest of them take? Just the default order? Yeah, just the default order, yeah. Okay. I'm thinking if I can see if I can come up with something here real quick. That's not a good bad example to use the... Okay, so that one... That seemed to do it, if I'm interpreting this correctly. It moved the one that I selected here, re-level, selected Jewish, that became number one. Mm -hmm. And the rest of them took their, um, their normal order. So I think you're right, re-level would work. Question, one more thing. I wanna see if this works too. Okay. Take an exclamation point and put it before FCT relevel. See if it flips it. I just want to see. Nope, does not. So I tried to but, see what I could. But there is a reverse. Oh, okay. So um, let me do FCT reverse. And yeah, you got a parenthesis that you're missing. Oh, uh, I hate that it does that. What did I end up with wrong number of parentheses somewhere? Okay, so that's that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Is that gonna do it? Yep, there you go. So it bumps the one that you're looking for right up to the top. Yeah, and I mean, you could probably add to it too. So say you're like, you're interested in two groups or three groups, you could keep adding it to that concatenate. So like, if you're interested in Jewish, Christian, Buddhism or something, so. Yeah. Hmm. That's neat. Yeah, this is this is kind of amazing. I've never had this much luck with uh, a package before, just, just doing it on the fly. Usually I try something and I have like 15 minutes of errors and then by the time I resolve all those, I've forgotten what I was trying to do in the first place. But, um, but I spelled this one wrong. So that's interesting too. All right. Well, good. So that's, that's four cats, categorical variables. It sounds like you guys have some experience with, and um, I know a project that I'm working on, it's gonna come in really handy. So I'm, I'm excited to use it a little bit more. Anybody else, any other comments or questions or things you want to explore a little bit? You good? All right. Then next week is chapter 16, dates and times, and Maria is going to do that one. So I'm looking forward to that. Super excited. That covers the Lubridate package. Is that the one you're going to, you're going to cover? Yep, that one. Awesome. I know, uh, I know I could use some help understanding that one. Very good. All right. So we'll look forward to that. Same time, same place. Thank you, Maria. And one last meme for you under getting help. Doctors, Googling stuff online does not make you a doctor. Programmers, maybe. So we've always got these resources. Don't forget asking questions, Googling, Slack, um, Slack helped me out today. I got an answer really quickly to that question that I had about making the factors permanent. Um, couldn't, I couldn't get to the end in my mind. And so I just put it in the Slack and within 10 minutes I had an answer. So, so it was really good. And all the other ones too. All right. Well, thank you guys again. Uh, uh, before yeah. you, before we jump off, Ryan, uh, yeah. Just a quick reminder about the, the GitHub that is available for this. Um, so uh, I'm not hey. sure how, oh, oh, am I muted? No, no, do you wanna share?
Yeah, I'll, I can share it real quickly. So I'm going to post it here. I'm going to post it in the chat and then I can share it real quick. So I didn't know about this until I was looking at the Slack, but um, well, I'm not going to talk specifically about GitHub or Git right now. I'm just going to talk about the resource that's available to you. So basically it's a resource and I can share my screen here that compiles all of our videos, all of our notes for everything. And so I went through and I updated it for cohort number four. And so if you like would like to refer back to another video or previous slides that we have went through, they are available to you. Um, I'm still trying to hunt down a couple of them. So Sandra, I think I reached out to you. And then Ryan, I think there's a couple that I'm missing for you as well. But I'm going to try and keep this updated for the group so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. You get like, like oh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, basically what you'll be able to access is you'll be able to see like where we're at meetings wise. You'll be able to see the future meetings. Obviously they're tentative. So um, things change. We take time on other things, but what's also nice, it compiles all of our notes and like, say if we're, if you're interested in, you know, going back to something, or if you want to look at another cohort stuff, it's all pretty much available in here. So if you're having trouble with a concept or something, you can access it. I've noticed that we've been doing pretty good. Uh, I think some other people have kind of like trailed off around like the chapter 20. Yeah. At least I th at least I think I, they might still be doing it. They're just not updating this. So I think we're doing pretty good of, of keeping up to date and keeping moving forward. So I think we can get to the all 30 chapters of this. I think we got a pretty good group. So yeah, uh, that's that's cool. Yeah, I had wondered if people started to lose interest or didn't attend or whatever. And I'm, I'm really pleased and really appreciate everybody on this call, your, your uh, commitment to, to keeping it alive. It's helping me a lot for sure. So I appreciate that. Um, I would be interested to know what week, what's the date projecting out? What's the date for that very last week? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it. I mean, we're already in May for wait 21. Yeah, for chapter 21. So another nine weeks from there. So probably what? Yeah. Summer, yeah like July. <laughs> yeah, summer. <laughs> July. <Okay. laughs> All right. Well, uh, I've got time off in the middle of June. And, and so that if it doesn't happen first, that might be the first week that we that we take a break. But or you guys just do it without me. There's always that. I'll just come watch the YouTube afterwards. <laughs> so. We'll see how it goes, but we might be the first ones to like get through it and have all of our materials up. And then, so we can say yeah. that we were the, I mean, I'm sure there's another cohort that's doing it, yeah. but I mean, we can be the first ones to have all of our materials up. So we should do it. And then we can all meet up somewhere and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where, but <laughs> cool. let me know which one is still available and I will take one. Uh, I will do uh, one uh, whenever. Okay, I think the only one that's spoken for besides Maria next week with chapter 16 and Colin chapter 19, uh, no, you wanted to do 19 and 21, Colin, right? So anything else in there is good. We'll, we'll get we'll get back to you on that, Sandra, and let you know. So we've still got some time, so. Yeah, you can, you can look at the GitHub and I think I have everybody's name for it too, of who's got what, and I'll update it, but. Um, okay, I will look, thank you. Yeah. All right. Very good, guys. We'll stay in touch. We'll, other than that, we will talk to you guys next week. Thank you so much. It was, it was super helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. See ya. Bye-bye.